Welcome to the Motivated Martial Arts Podcast. Your hosts, Jackson White and Gavin Cook, have been friends and Taekwondo training partners for over 40 years. This podcast will bring you a mixture of their life stories, martial arts, and business experiences to motivate you in life and throughout your martial arts journey. Adding in a mixture of inspiring interviews and some of the best traditional martial artists around today. So over to your hosts, the Motivated Martial Artists. This podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, skillsconnect.co.uk, the world's leading children's development program for martial arts. If you would like to know more about what the Motivated Martial Artists have lined up for the rest of this year, come along and see us at the UK Martial Arts Show in Doncaster Dome on the 2nd and 3rd of May, where we'll be on the main stage with our US partners, Skills Worldwide. Hello and welcome to the Motivated Martial Artist Podcast with me, Jackson White. And Gavin Cook. And today we're in downtown St. Petersburg, Florida with Skills Executive Team Member and Technical Consultant, Mike Evans. Hi, Mike. Hi. Glad to be here. Good to see you, Mike. Howdy. Uh, so the weather's really good. You know, we're having a great time doing our, our USA uh, podcasting episodes. So we wanted to bring Mike in, who knows all all there is to know around the Skills uh, Connect program. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Gavin and get the first uh, questions fired away, Mike. Okay, Mike. So um, it's been obviously great to see you. You know, we've uh, been chatting on the phone for the last uh, couple of months, and um, obviously we're keen to keen to understand how you got involved with Skills and stuff like that. But really, just talk us about how you first got into martial arts and um, and what is your backstory really sure so I, I originally started training uh, I guess it was around 11 years old and my dad was my first instructor we didn't do any official rank or anything he learned some Okinawan karate when he was in the Marine Corps cool so when my cousins used to beat me up he would pull me outside and we would go through just some moves uh, that kind of fed a passion for me uh, and I started uh, seriously training went around to a couple different arts there weren't really established schools by me oh, back no, then no. Um, I went off did a year as an exchange student in Turkey and learned some Taekwondo and some wrestling while I was there cool uh, I came back to the United States kind of messed around my senior year of high school <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, my career plan at that point was to go into the Marine Corps I come from a military family so it was kind of a natural step for me. Uh, it was my only life plan. So after uh, a little less than a year of being in the Marine Corps, I got hurt and sent home. It was a time when our government was really shrinking our military. Uh, so they discharged me and I had no life plan, no direction, no goal. And I ended up really getting into a lot of trouble for a summer. And uh, one day I woke up still kind of uh, feeling it from the night before and you know I made this decision that if I didn't change something that day uh, I might not see another one uh, it was a pretty self-destructive point in my life was was there a catalyst for that was there a one one what was it a single incident or if you like or you was know, it a combination of different things amalgamating over over time it was a little bit of a combination so it was I had Everything that I'd been planning in my life for 19 years was gone. Sure. Uh, my girlfriend broke up with me a week later. Uh, I couldn't get a job because technically I was on a medical discharge, which while it wasn't anything major, you still had to follow the rules until all the paperwork came through. Uh, so it was a pretty depressing time. And then of course, we know at this point in our life that we become most like the people that we hang out with. Sure. And I come from a really small town where everybody drinks, does a lot of drugs up in the woods. So yeah. I kind of fell back in with my old friends and just went down step by step, but down a wrong path. It's, it's hard to change, isn't it? I know I was having this conversation last night about, you know, you're a, you're a, a net sum of the five or six people that you, and you knock around with. And, you know, I've certainly noticed that myself and me and Jackie, you know, over the last couple of years, we're really trying to surround ourselves with like-minded people, people who, you know, entrepreneurial people, people who want to move forward in their life, people who have ideas, and and over time, you you do change as a person. You get to a point, don't you, where you don't really enjoy hanging out with with the regular go-to-work type person who's you know can sit there and you know go down the pub and talk about what they you know what a rubbish day at work they've had and stuff like that. Sure, and I think it happens so subtly that 
you know, j just as we, I went down that wrong path one step at a time very subtly, you know, once I decided to make that change and I met my Sifu and, you know, he became my second father and really turned my life around, but it was also step by step. And I still made a lot of mistakes, but I really embraced training. Uh, I became, he didn't have a bedroom for me, but I was the closest you could be to a live-in student. You know, okay. I was with him probably 18 hours a day. Um, and then I ended up taking over his school when he retired and, and that set me up for potential which was something I, I for a little while in my life felt that I didn't have you know so that was I think the first steps toward becoming who I am today sure. um, I was unfortunately not a very good businessman so <laughs> I ended up closing the first school within a year so just just tell everyone um, sorry just just be uh, just before we come on I think we just need to mention that we are actually in a hotel lobby and there was a little bit of background noise, but you know, it adds, adds, to, adds to the uh, Florida experience, right? Indeed, yeah, that's yeah. definitely. Yeah, bit, sure. of, bit so, of Florida ambience. Exactly. So just just tell um, just tell the audience then um, where your school is, and you know what part of America and stuff you're from, and where, where the schools are. Sure. So I am on Long Island, which is uh, just off of the uh, the coast of the United States, New York. Um, about. Depending on traffic, anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours away from New York City. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's a it's a rural area, suburbia, pretty densely packed for what it is. Um, middle class, kind of average area. Okay. And so, what is the 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 martial arts population like in, in your area? Is it is it densely populated? Is it sparse? Are there, are there lots of competing styles? Are you competing a lot against other sports? How how, how does that work in your area? Yeah, so there's a tremendous amount of competition. Um, you know, up until a few years ago, unfortunately, a few schools have, have recently gone out of business, which is something that I really hate to see. Um, but up until a few years ago, there was probably 15 schools within a mile or three, uh, um, you know, of mine. Some of them were small in a church or in a community center. There's another school on the other side of town that has 800 students in their own building. So okay. there's a lot of competition. We also have a very robust uh, youth sports um, community. In fact, I think many people around me look at that as their way to college. So okay. parents push it really hard. So, so how was uh, how was your so so? I suppose go back to um, go back to when you originally. Obviously, set your schools up. You're a kung fu kung fu background. Yes, sir. Was it traditional kung fu that you used to teach within the schools? Yeah. So, I mean, we were pretty hardcore back in the day. Um, you know, sitting in horse stance with the, the hot tea in your head and. Oh, so, talk us through that. We we want to know more. So, sitting in horse stance, or we would call it sitting stance in the okay. kind of taekwondo. So, what was the uh, what was the sort of punishment and. Uh, you the discipline, I suppose. You breathed schools. wrong. You <laughs> blinked. You, you coughed, um, or Sifu just decided that you needed to be stronger that day. Okay. <laughs> you know? uh, so yeah, you'd get the the stance, and we put the staff across the legs and hang weights from it, and things on your head, and, and a candle on your head. Right? Yeah, we get candle. You, you'd sit over a candle, and you had to be low enough. But if you went too low, it burned you. <laughs> I mean. The things that we used to do would, would lead to major lawsuits nowadays. <laughs> uh, and looking back, it's all fond memories, but you know, I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody these days. Uh, I mean, we, we, we talk about this all the time about how you know the old school methods of teaching. You, know, you just can't apply those methodologies to anything today. You know, basically, for the if, if anything, now we understand child development. And, and, and how you should uh, engage with children, but even if you're engaging with adults like that, you know it's just not acceptable in today's society. Sure, and I, I think, I mean, a lot of people look at that and say that the arts are dying. And you know, some of my very good friends and mentors have that viewpoint. I look at it as, in a way, it's kind of fortunate that we don't necessarily live in a society where we need to. Now, sure, we need to be prepared, and we need to be. Uh, vigilant and ready to defend ourselves but the Manchus are not coming over the hill and, and sticking spears in me you know uh, we live in a good area where you know I have the ability to be mobile 
both geographically and financially and socially. So uh, we recognize today that, that there's more to this than just can you fight a cavalry charge? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting what you were saying earlier on that um, you know you were talking about people. People don't come to your school and they don't come to learn to defend themselves. Or sometimes they do, but it's very a small small proportion. Most people come to the school to learn different different development type skills. Even the adults, don't they? Sure. Um, you know, as a skill school and having gone through that transformation. Uh, we focus very much on skills that children are already developing and then use martial arts to help them with that. Uh, in my martial arts, my adult martial arts program, we do the same thing. And we spent a lot of time uh, polling people to see what it is that they actually want from training. And, and very few people worry about their personal safety. Now, could that be just that they're a little naive? Some of them, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, people are coming to martial arts schools, and it wasn't just mine, I did this as a national survey. Most of them are looking for friendships because today's society makes it really hard to develop meaningful relationships, yeah. mm -hmm. especially between men. Yeah, okay. you know, it's not really viewed kindly amongst, uh, especially Americans, sure. for, for men to have close personal relationships that are meaningful. So they're looking for that. They're looking for uh, confidence, not so much to stand up to bullies, but to be able to um, take chances. To, yeah. They know they need to take chances to be successful, but they're lacking that. They've never been taught that. Sure. So we find that, that those, um, those social and emotional and, and mindset skills are, are really a big part of what people are looking for. Fortunately, with the skills program, that, that's what we're able to offer. So, so talk us through um, the changes that you had to make for your, from your traditional background, traditional martial arts school, into a, a pretty much a school which pretty much only focuses on the skills program. Yeah, before, before you get into that, can you just tell us how you got into skills? What was your journey into it? What led you on that path? Sure. So uh, my own teacher was pretty innovative and uh, in our area was one of the first ones to, much like Melody did, recognize that all kids shouldn't be together. He did not uh, put together a program like Melody has, but he recognized that something was off. So I kind of got the concept of teaching different age groups uh, that way. So when I opened my own school the second time, because the first time was uh, not so good, <laughs> Uh, I got myself some coaching and some help, and we ended up using Melody's older programs uh, as a plug-and-play sort of way to train instructors about how to teach kids. And it was very rudimentary back then. Uh, so we sent one of our instructors down to get trained, and she came back, and it was, look, I don't even want to teach kids. My mindset was, I need kids to pay the bills. Yeah. I'm going to beat up the adults, because that's what I love. But yeah, sure. So the next step from there was um, after the economy collapsed here in 2008 we lost our lease at the same time and we had to kind of reinvent ourselves as a school okay so when it came time to say let's go public again and renovate things and revamp things we loved the the ideas that melody had brought in the original program so when we sought her out again she had now moved on and brought this skills program and it was just Oh my God, that's amazing. Um, I'm pretty scientific minded myself. My degree is in massage therapy, so I love having science background to everything. Sure. So we started looking into it and realized it was much more now than just, ah, oh, yeah, you send your instructor in with these workbooks and they'll read off the paper and it's all good. Uh, and that there was why behind it, you know, like why do we do these things? Yeah. So we. Uh, it was a little tough for us in the beginning because there were no lower level memberships back then. It was just the gold membership sure. or what became yeah. the gold membership. Yeah. Yeah. So I think our first mindset shift was, look, we're really failing at teaching kids martial arts. We need help, but we can't afford help. So we put it on a credit card. Okay. <laughs> uh, we saw Melody at a show and she offered a special. I think it was probably the dollar special that, that's going on now. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and we bought in with the faith that after the first month, we'd be able to recoup some of this. Okay, yeah. And it worked so sparklingly that 
we opened a program at the time nobody by us was teaching three and four year olds and we got calls every day and my answer was always no they're not even human yet they don't even speak <laughs> English yet <laughs> you know I don't want to wipe noses yeah. but when you know, we saw Melody speak it, it let us know alright it's possible yeah so within a month, we had about 23-year-olds from zero, okay. which allowed us to pay for the skills program. Brilliant. And then we just, over the course of uh, about a year, we started bringing in skills methods and skills formats. Still teaching Kung Fu, yeah. you know, doing our forms and our basics and wearing our uniforms, yeah. but changing the way that we taught. And then just over the course of time, we realized that this is working really well, but not perfectly. Yeah. Because we weren't integrating things physically, the way that we were trying to do uh, int intellectually or socially in the classes. So finally, after having followed Melody for about 15 years, last year we just made the shift and we are 100% a skills school until you get about halfway through our adult program, which is now when we start becoming more of a Kung Fu school again. Okay. And just, um, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get back onto that in a second, but just take us a step back because you had quite an interesting story about how you lost your your first lease and what happened with your students. And just, just t t take us through that again. Sure. So when you have one of the benefits, I think, of, of the traditional world, we turn a lot of people away or we scare a lot of people away. Yeah. And, and we have, and I say we very generally, we have that mindset that, well, they weren't good enough for us. They weren't ready for what we bring. But the benefit of that becomes that the few people that do stay around us are fiercely loyal, yeah. fiercely dedicated. Sure. If my teacher called today, I'd have to say, sorry, guys, and catch an Uber back up to New York. You know, yeah. We're fiercely loyal. So when we closed the first bit, um, school there, we lost our lease. We closed that business. And I said, you know what? This is it. I'm done with this. There's no money to be made in this industry. And some of my students who knew my vision before I got depressed about closing the business, they said, well, sorry, but we just leased you some space in the Aikido school down the road. Class starts on Monday. So I said some potty words. and. Yeah. <laughs> we, we opened class again. That must have been emotional though. That must have been an emotional time to actually think, you know what, I can't believe these guys have, have gone and done that. You know. It was, and you know, I was going through an emotional time to begin with, between you know, just the stresses of the, the economy being unsure, losing my school through not much fault of my own that time. Uh, I was also going through a divorce, and you know, it was a pretty, it was full of tumult at that time. Yeah. So to have that that seed of that that core of people it, it was it was a positive experience when I most needed it um, and they're very intelligent people engineers and, and inventors and so they were able to preserve my vision when I couldn't yeah I think it's really important to have somebody in your life like that nowadays it kind of takes the form of a mentor or a coach or an accountability partner sure. but we didn't know that back then I, I had these five guys yeah. and they're still with me I think, yeah, but they'll be with you for life now. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's jump forward again and, and talk about the, what, what sort of challenges did you have integrating skills into your, the skills program, into your schools? Was there resistance from your students, from your other instructors? How, how did that go? So there was some resistance from the, the people that have been with me for a while, the, the really traditional guys. But they, as I mentioned, they're pretty scientific minded. So I have my, he's actually my older training brother and I inherited him from my teacher as a student. So while he's my student, he's also somebody that I respect very much. He's an engineer. So if he doesn't understand it, he says no. Okay. You know, that, that's his initial. So when I was able to come in and really understand what we were doing and explain it to him, so he sat back paused and said huh that was kind of enough to let me know that I could get through that resistance okay, good, yeah. and, and he actually became a big advocate of it and while he's not a teacher um, he did come to our last instructor certification because he buys into it mm -hmm. 
So there was resistance among my senior students. Some of the parents were a little leery at first, especially because as a Kung Fu school, we dressed a certain way, sure. we had certain beliefs and certain culture, and there was some change. Yeah. But we were able to educate them and show them the benefits and show them that their students weren't losing anything. You know, They weren't going down in rank because of belt color changed. It was no. just very different. And then once they saw it, 99% immediately came on board. Okay. With the kids, there was a little hesitation because, uh, you know, d depending on stage of development, we know that fear can, can affect them a little differently. Well, I know that now, anyway. What we did was we actually snuck in our first skills class. Okay. We walked in, we bowed in the same way we always did, we warmed up, and then I taught a skills class. And, uh, you know, being the old school guy, I actually selected the discipline skill as our first class. Because I said, all right, discipline, I'm down for that. I'm going to discipline the boogers out of these kids. Yeah. <laughs> so after class was over, this little kid, it was like his second or third class, he comes up to me, head drooped down, you know, a little forlorn look. And he comes up to me and says, Sifu can I tell you something? I was like, oh great, here we go. I just invested all this money. And he looks up at me with these big bright eyes and he goes, that was the best class ever. I love discipline. And like that moment, you know, it was just infectious how it ripped through the school. The parents saw that. I got that feedback because, you know, we need validation as no, well. Of course. No, no, we do, yeah. And I, I think sometimes it, it can be quite a lonely place sometimes. You're there on your own, you're teaching your school and it's... And, you don't necessarily know what parents and students are thinking. I mean, I had, I know we had our Christmas party obviously over, over December, and um, I had a couple of parents that I see every week. They sit there and they watch, they watch the. the it's actually a skills skills class that I do uh, within a school, and um, they sit there every week. And two or three of them said, "You know what? You know, oh, we've seen such a change. You know, we've tried lots of different things. We've tried football, we've tried rugby, and never took to it. But you can see already, even in the six to seven weeks they've been doing it, mm -hmm. they're starting to." concentrate better at school and it's just so rewarding when you hear that you know because you don't you don't know do you until yeah. they actually say it yeah. and they don't often say it in a class because you're so busy you know you you do your class you're rushing on to the next class you get your pads well like oh, it's, see you guys i've got to go to the next class or whatever but when you're in that social environment you get a chance to chat to them and they're sort of saying these things it just reinforces what we do i suppose as martial sure. arts instructors yeah and nowadays the parents love it and in fact the culture of our school has changed uh, you know, we, we've increased our rates probably 120% since, you know, we initiated skills. We're probably going to go up again um, in March. We've grown since, since we instituted the very beginning of skills. We've grown by something like 800%, both in student count and in revenue. Uh, and the... the the look of our lobby has changed, not in a sense of the paint on the wall, but instead of the people coming in saying, you're close and you're cheap and I don't care, take my care of my kid, yes. where our lobby is filled with psychologists, doctors, teachers, you know, all these people that, this is already the language they speak. Yes. So when I start saying, I'm not gonna fix your kid, Tell me about your child. Let me tell you about stage of development and how we're going to work this. Sure. It really um, you know, makes it an easy thing for them to now sign up with us because they already believe what we believe. Yeah. So how, how's the skills program helped you manage your time? Because I know within the skills program there's a lot of, uh, it, it lays out a, a syllabus for you. How has that allowed you to uh, support the growth of your business? So the planners alone and the class formats alone has helped a lot, uh, especially as we've grown. We went from something like 12 classes a week to uh, I think we're at like 45 classes a week now. 45 classes? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And, and we have still space for more. We just haven't chosen to open those up yet. We also decided that we like being a little smaller, so it's mm -hmm. very personal. So, But we have potential for more growth. So as you have all these things, that also means you have to add more time to clean more and yeah. do billing more and do all these other things. And using the format of skills, aside from you know 
having the nice system so I personally always know what's going on, mm -hmm. it made it so easy to train instructors where I used to have to groom somebody through the ranks, get them up to a certain degree of black belt, then teach them how to be a teacher. My partner uh, teaches from 18 months old all the way up to about six or seven. She's never been a martial artist a day in her life and the kids that she turns out, while maybe they might not work, win any world championships, they come into my class so prepared and yeah. so eager yeah. to learn that when they jump into what now I'm teaching at a slightly higher level, it's amazing how quickly they, they jump into it. So from a staffing and training perspective, having that really made it much easier to manage my time uh, and, and to help others help me manage that time. Which once you get now into a habit, that trickles out to the rest of your business. Yeah. Um, and then you combine that with the coaching that I do with Melody, really changed my mindset in a lot of ways that uh, stopped a lot of my self-defeating you know, attitudes that we all have. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, and it allowed me to really maximize myself as a business owner, uh, just through mindset shifts. Okay. So we, we were talking earlier about you know self development and the, the great advantage of having mentors and, and engaging around like minded people. Yeah, you know, we, we talked also about the audio books. You know, we listen to a lot of different audio books. What was the last audio book that you listened to? Uh, I'm going to be honest. I'm not really an audio book person, personally. What? <laughs> now, so consider we can change that. We can change that. Well, consider this though. So, even though I'm not as traditional a kung fu guy as I used to be, a certain piece of me is still a little old fashioned. Okay. So I personally find great value in holding a book, uh, yeah, yeah. turning the page, yeah. smelling the book. So to me, it's experiential. Uh, it's just my medium. I prefer to read. Um, so actually the, the last uh, book that I just reread, a book that I've read several times now, uh, is The Whole Brain Child by Dan Siegel. Okay, yeah. Which uh, Melody was just talking, talking about, about yeah, I've, today. I've literally just put it on my wish list on my, for audio. So. Yeah, it, it's a great book and much like you know the value of us hanging out once in a while to refresh the, the influence that we have on one another, yeah, yeah. I, I go back to that book a lot because it's written for parents. So it kind of refreshes me on, this is how you take all this knowledge and actually apply it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, which, while I am a parent, I also want to make sure that the parents in my school have the resources that they need to recognize what it is that we're doing. So that's a great book that I'm able to, um, you know, read, refresh myself, and then turn around and, and, and uh, reissue that knowledge. Okay. 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 So we're almost almost going to wrap it up, Mike. But one question we ask everybody, as we are the motivated martial artists, what what's what's now motivating you in life? Uh, I think the thing that motivates me the most is seeing the potential impact that I have, not only on my students but the community around me beyond just making them see. Um, since instituting the skills program, I've had students go on to do some pretty great things. Um, so it shows that my impact in the world, it's a pretty crazy world out there right now. You know, yeah, sure no matter what country you're in, the, the politics are so divisive yeah. without getting into one side or the other. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so much stress in the world because we're constantly connected. So being able to provide at least a stabilizing force and knowing that whatever shape the world takes tomorrow i'm going to have a little legacy yeah. you, you you've little made a difference haven't you the thing yeah. is you, you've made a difference to every single one of your students yeah and yeah and, and it almost sounds egotistical but you know also as a father i'm trying to create a better world for my daughter to grow sure. into sure you know that's my ultimate goal i look at her and i see what world do I have to create to know she's going to be okay? Yeah. And that's what I do through my teaching now. I hope. Yeah. Well, 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 time it, will it, tell. You've got to have an aspiration. Yeah. You know, and, 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 a, and a vision to, to, to work towards. So, talking of, of working towards, 
we're, we're obviously we're promoting now into the UK with the motivated martial artists in partnership with, with Skills Connect. What advice would you give to an instructor that's on the brink of thinking, yeah, it sounds like a good program, should I give it a try, should I not? What advice would you give them? So a lot of times uh, what happens is we train our students a certain way and then when it's time for us to apply that same exact lesson, we go the exact opposite direction. Very true. Yeah. When you're teaching your student how to fight, you don't just teach them one technique. You say, let's try this. Let's see what happens. Let's experiment with this. Until you build a solid repertoire. Now as an instructor, I say, here's another option. Most people will err on the side of caution. It's the unknown. It's human nature. You know, it's not to say anything against people. So my advice would be, try it. Even if you take 1% away from it that you found was good, you became a better instructor. Sure. You won't become a worse instructor for it. Yeah. Of course, I firmly believe, and yes, I work for the company, but I'm also a school owner. I firmly believe that once you try it, you'll want more of what it is. Maybe even if it's not a membership, you'll want the association with people like us who are so committed to not only being martial artists, but being people who know how to help kids develop. And, and I think you're right. I mean, and, and I was I was that guy as well. I was that guy a year and a half, two years ago, um, that uh, Gordon, obviously a good friend of ours, uh, Gordon Fern, who's been on the podcast a few times, uh, well, he, he, he mentioned to us about the skills program. And then I was a bit like, well, you know what, it sounds a bit American. Is it really mm -hmm. going to fit in with my school? You know, what am I going to have to change? So I went, you know, I went low ball and I, I went with the, the bronze package. And I got a couple of modules from the bronze package and built it into my school. And, and now I'm sitting here with you guys as a lifetime member and Jackson's now a lifetime member and you're a lifetime member. And we've totally bought into it because we can see from, certainly for me, from running it with my, in my own schools, the impact that it's made on the um, on my club and the retention, more importantly. So let me ask you a question. So up until uh, a little while ago, you were a bronze level member. Yep. You got value out of that? Yes. Okay. So now you see everything that we have to offer. It's blown my mind. Okay. <laughs> blown your mind. Yeah. Do you think that you have a full understanding and the ability to implement 100% everything that you see yet? No. I'm right. So there's always more. Sure. Right. Yeah. And and that's what we want for our martial arts. We always want to be better, achieve more. Yeah. Especially like you guys are Taekwondo. You have that that champion mentality, looking for that sport, that world champion. Sure. You know, you always want more. Why wouldn't you want to be a better instructor that same way? Absolutely. Yeah. I you mean, know? I mean, this and this weekend, you know, obviously we've looked. Oh, we had a long chat with you, and a good chat with Melody, and we've looked at the. Um, at the, at the skills website and all of the all of the modules and stuff that are on there and there is so much on there it's just it's going to take me weeks and weeks to even think about getting through it but it's opened so many avenues I mean we were saying that earlier on and we were talking about the, the spectrum skills that we run and they can run and the ladies kickboxing class that sure. you can run alongside your schools and um, the way you can implement it may be in after school clubs you know a lot of the people in the UK run after school clubs alongside their their um, their main syllabus, but obviously after school clubs, you don't tend to necessarily teach your main syllabus because you have to teach it a little bit differently because you make kids come and they go, yep. you know, and you don't necessarily do grading. So the skills, I can see a lot of value from adding the skills stuff into the after school clubs. Sure. You know, so. Yeah, I mean we currently have 17 separate skills programs, and then when you consider that skills is not really a martial art per se. It's a method of teaching. A child development program. It's a child yeah. development program. Using martial arts as that vehicle. Martial arts yeah. happens to be the one that we went with to sell. Yes. You could very easily make that a basket weaving skills. Okay. Or um, a polo skills or a rugby skills. Sure. Or a mathematics skills. Sure. You know, it, it, it's something that really can change the way that you look at interaction with other humans. Wow, I should patent that line. We've got on. We've got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've date time stamped it. It's fine. <laughs> so we're, we're going to wrap up there then, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners will have, will have taken a lot of valuable points away from today. So 
we'd like to say thank you very much. It's great having uh, being on board as part of the the skills family, and hopefully this uh, particular podcast will encourage more instructors to get on board as well. And we look forward to welcoming them into the family. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm really excited about where this is going, and uh, you know, I love the skills members we have over there already, and I can't wait to uh, meet more of you. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it'll be great getting you over into the UK. Yeah, we'll, we'll do some learning and some partying. That's how it works. Absolutely. Let's, uh, should we just chink our beer glasses right. together? We're, we're we? going to have to make come, a come, can chink. Come back, it's a plastic cup, so we have to go ching, ching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, lovely. Right. Thank you very much. Cheers, Jack. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your listening platform. It would be awesome if you could also leave us a review. We really appreciate your value feedback. Also, check out our website, themotivatedmartialartist.com. We also have a YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook page and Facebook group. All the links are available on the show notes below. We'd like to thank again our show sponsors, skillsconnect.co.uk, the world's leading children's development program for martial arts. If you're a martial arts school owner or instructor and are looking for some inspiration, ideas or drills for your children's classes, make sure you check the skills out.